Uh, I guess I'm supposed to talk about the future of marketing, but I want to start by talking about the past. As I was getting ready to come here today, uh, I was looking through my office, which has layers of patina up top patina, uh, through 33 years of projects. And I came across this. This was my dad's slide rule. And I have to confess that Sam, who runs operations for the Alt-MBA, didn't know what a slide rule was. And she's pretty smart. She's just not old like me. And a slide rule is what an engineer carried around. It even has my dad's name engraved in it. Because engineers make stuff. And engineers understand that there's a right answer. And you can use a slide rule to look up the right answer. And you can figure out that that bridge is not going to fall down. And my dad was a great engineer. But I was thinking a lot about what we make. Because we don't have slide rules. But we make something. Well, mostly, if we're any good at it, we make mistakes. 33 years ago, early on in one of my first projects, my only real job, I needed help from an author. I wanted to license rights from him. And he lived in New York, and I was in Boston. I wanted to get the software, the videotape rights. And he wouldn't meet with me, and he wouldn't meet with me, and then he finally agreed to meet with me in New York. So I flew on the shuttle, and I had my first meeting of the day in my mental map somewhere near Chelsea, and I didn't know New York very well. I just knew that my next meeting was with him at noon at the New York Athletic Club near Central Park, and it was pouring rain, rain like it was raining the other day. And I didn't really understand the subway system, and there were no cabs, so I ran from <laughs> 11th Street to 57th Street in the rain. And I arrive at the New York Athletic Club, drenched, and I finally take off my jacket. And they go, no, 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 no. You're in the New York Athletic Club. You have to wear a jacket. So I wring out my $88 suit, put it back on, and I'm sitting there across from him, dripping wet, making my pitch. And I was getting nowhere. He was not interested. And I was dying. 24 years old. I'm in the New York Athletic Club, and I'm not doing very well. And there above him is a stuffed moose head. And the idea of a stuffed moose head inside the New York Athletic Club brought back that famous long joke about the Berkowitzes, which I proceeded to tell him in complete detail without missing a word. <laughs> and at the end of the joke, he didn't even smile. It was a failure. A few years later, a bunch of years later, 20 years ago this year, I had a book that I was working on called Permission Marketing. And I sent a note to the great Jack Trout, the author of Positioning, with a copy of my galley. And I said, Jack, it would be really great if you would endorse this book. And Jack, when you send out books to, to get endorsements, by the way, you, people just don't write back. You either don't hear from them, or one out of 100 people send you a blurb. Jack writes back a five-paragraph letter explaining to me and my editor that the book will never work, that it's a lousy idea, and I should go back to what I was supposed to be doing. Shortly after that, I self-published a book on an idea of political action. And it was about women's rights to choose. And I couldn't find a publisher for it, so I printed 30,000 copies. And my wife and I had 29,450 copies in our garage. <laughs> Well, they had a giant march on Washington, and more than half a million women marched in that. And I bought a booth on the parade route, rented a van, and filled it with 29,300 copies, holding a few back, and a giant tank of helium with a bunch of uh, balloons, white balloons. And the idea would be I would take my little booth and have a giant arch of balloons, and then my stack of books totally aligned with the audience I was seeking to serve. So I get to the mall, and it's 45 degrees. Telling the story actually makes my hands hurt. It's 45 degrees out. I get to the mall two hours before the march. I take out my helium tank. And under the watchful gaze of the National Park Service rangers who wear those hats with the flat brims, I blew up 200 of these balloons and tied each one, and finally had the whole archway done. And the ranger walked over and said, no balloons on the mall. And she made me pop every one of the 200 <laughs> balloons she had seen me inflate. And that day, sitting on the march, watching 400,000 people walk by, I sold two copies of the book. And then uh, 
The last one was I was building Yoyodai, the internet company that practiced permission marketing. And our biggest client was AOL. And we sent out an email on AOL's behalf to uh, 100,000 of their users. Unfortunately, the servers messed up, and we sent them the email that we had designed for Carter Wallace about arid extra dry deodorant. <laughs> and that was a problem. So the vice president of AOL, whose stock was rocketing, called me up and screamed at me on the phone because she was worried that her stock wasn't going to keep rocketing. And I understandably freaked out and said, this will never happen again. So a week later, the next email went out, and 100,000 people from AOL got an ad for arid extra dry deodorant again. <laughs> and she called me up, and she said, Seth, you, you, and I said, I'm not going to panic about this. I'm flying down to Vienna, Virginia. I want to apologize to you face to face, explain how this happened. And Audrey said, if you set foot on our campus, I will have you arrested. <laughs> well, the third week, after we rebuilt all our systems, I get to work because there was no internet at home in those days. And I check my email and the special account I have on AOL, and yes, there's an email in there from Arid Extra Dry Deodorant. So I called Dan, my head of technology in Boston, and I said, Dan, because he had gotten the same email at 7 in the morning. Fortunately, my Boston office was in the basement of a building on Mystic Valley Parkway. And as a result, Dan could not kill himself by jumping out the window. <laughs> there was no gas oven either. And it turned out the only three people in the world who got the email were me, the head of engineering, and one other guy. Audrey never got it. And I'm here today to tell you the story. <laughs> and the last failure is not mine. The last failure belongs to Benjamin Lay. Uh, a couple hundred years ago, Benjamin Lay was a radical Quaker from the original British tradition of radical Quakerism. And he was in Philadelphia and saw what was going on in slavery. And he could not abide this. And he could not abide the fact that many of the leading Quakers of Philadelphia were slaveholders. And so he did what? almost any great marketer would do, which is he found a pig's bladder, and he filled it with red juice, and he hid it inside a Bible. And he went to the meeting of all the elders, the most influential elders, and Benjamin Lay stood up in front of them and took a sword and <laughs> struck it right through the Bible, and blood spewed all over the bima, and they threw him out. And he set back the anti-slavery abolition movement by at least a decade. And as a result, untold people, untold numbers of people suffered. Because sometimes marketing works and sometimes it doesn't. But getting it right is important. And the reason it's important is we don't make bridges and we're not always right. But what we make, in the words of Michael Schrag, is we make change happen. That's what we do, is we change the culture. We don't run ads. And we don't interrupt people with freestanding inserts or phone spam. We change the culture. That's our job. So Betty Friedan and Jane Jacobs were marketers. That the reason the city that we live in is like the city that it is is because Jane Jacobs was a great marketer. Madam C.J. Walker, one of the first black millionaires in the United States, lived just down the street from me in uh, Irvington, New York. And she changed the lives of millions of women because she was a marketer. And Julian Shear, whose name you probably don't even know, is responsible for the fact that the public supported NASA for 10 long years when they built the Apollo program. Because even though he didn't have a penny to spend on advertising, at the very moment that Don Draper was spending millions, he figured out how to tell a story that would change the culture. And so it's easy for us to look around and say, we're just doing our job. We're just doing what the client wants. We're trying to maximize shareholder value. But I think that that's a really poor excuse to be in a job where you're going to fail all the time. Along the way, I've had untold lucky breaks. Uh, born on the right day to the right parents in the right house, marry the right woman, have the right family. But as a marketer, you know, I was just getting started and I got to meet Jay Levinson, the father of guerrilla marketing. And my pitch to Jay 
was let's make more books. And we were at Jay's house in rural California, north of San Francisco. And he had a dog, and he lived on a cliff. And he used to throw a tennis ball down, and the dog loved to go all the way down the hill and bring it back up. So he hands me the ball, and he says, see that pole down there? Think you can hit that pole? Now, in my entire life, I have never thrown a ball more than 20 or 30 feet. And I stopped playing ball with my kids when they turned six, because after that, it would be embarrassing. And the pole is, you know, 400,000 feet away. And I grab the ball, and I close my eye, and I throw it as hard as I can, and it hits the damn pole. And Jay turns to me and says, you got a deal. And so I got to be a marketing author. And a few years later, when I was working on permission marketing, my editor happened to be Nabokov's editor. And Nabokov, being dead, um, wasn't taking very much of his time. But Fred didn't think very much of me and my work. And he said, just design the cover, anything you want. And so I used Brian Smale's photo on the cover, which was unheard of in 1998 for a business book to look like that. And I got lucky again. And I just keep getting lucky time after time because I ignore how much my fingers used to hurt and ignore all the times it doesn't work. So here we are in you know, Bob Greenberg's beautiful office. And we can point to the. 50 home runs that he and his team have had. And we're just going to ignore the 5,000 times it didn't work, because there is no slide rule. And so the future of marketing, I think, is about having the guts to do something that matters, not because the client wants us to or not because it's in a manual, but because we can. And so the last story I'll tell you before I get off stage, because no one told me how long I was supposed to talk, <laughs> is this. A few years ago, I was with my wife and my kids. It was a beautiful, beautiful night in New Mexico. I have no idea, just like tonight, why I was at this event, but I was there. And uh, there was a big campfire. It was so cold, they gave everybody a blanket. And our guest speaker came out. And as the sun was setting, Neil Armstrong, who you've heard of because of Julian Shear, got up and told us the story of the Apollo 11 mission. And Neil was also a great marketer, shy, but a great marketer. Because as he was talking, the moon was rising over his shoulder. And he stopped in the middle of his story, and he turned and he said, I've been there. <laughs> Here's the thing, folks. There are footprints on the moon. And if we can foot put footprints on the moon, surely we can do work that matters. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.